are a um, modern and luxurious community and we're located right in downtown One Loudon. We serve independent living, assisted living, and also memory care at our, uh, at our community. And kind of what we like to do, we really like to have a very active and, uh, and, and fun environment for our residents and our uh, staff here as well. Um, I myself am pretty new to the area, uh, new to the uh, community rather, and it has not taken me very long to really warm up to our, uh, our residents. We have a wonderful group here. Um, some of them are uh, over here as well, taking around a little bit. Some of them are over here as well, having a little outside lunch today, which is wonderful. Nice. And uh, we're just enjoying the, uh, the wonderful spring weather before it gets a little too hot here. But uh, uh, we are located right in the downtown, uh, One Loudon. We're actually right across uh, the street. It's really not much of a street. It's more of the park uh, from our uh, downtown One Loudon. So I love it. Uh, any questions you have, send them my way. Yeah, and folks, uh, for those of you in Northern Virginia, you heard Andrew is relatively new to this position, came over from the hospitality industry. So give him a call, introduce yourself, and get to know uh, Tribute One Loudon. And now I've got uh, your colleagues across the river uh, there at um, Tribute at Black Hills. We got Georgette and Beth. Uh, Georgette, tell us a little bit about where you are, and you got to unmute yourself there. Here, I'll ask you to unmute, and um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and where you're at. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having uh, myself and Beth, and uh, we're here in our beautiful resort-style community, Tribute to Black Hill, located right across the street from Black Hill Park, which has a beautiful view. And um, like Andrew, myself, I came from the hospitality industry, and I started here back in um, January. And uh, we are a resort stop community. We're located in Germantown off of exit 16, I-270. And um, Beth, tell us a little bit more. Beth, say hello. Sure. Hey, hi, everybody. Um, actually, I have been with uh, Tribute since the get-go, since we opened our doors. And actually, prior to that, um, uh, we opened our doors last March. Super excited that things have, have kind of um, changed for all of us, right? And, and um, we're able to be outside without our masks, which is exciting. We did, like Andrew, we had residents out here, but they ran inside for lunch. They left us, <laughs> just left us. They did, they <laughs> literally just picked up and went inside. And Excellent. we have four to ceiling glass view from our dining room outside to the courtyard. So it's very pretty. I love it. And we're we're right. really excited to be in Germantown and, and up county. Um, you know, one of the, the few communities uh, that represents here. So come on in and see us. We, we would love We're to. open for toys. All right. This is great, man. I, I love it. So, uh, well, thank you guys for supporting us this month. And um, we'll look forward to, to seeing a couple of your other locations next week. But um, everybody reach out to the, these teams do some networking. They're, they're wonderful people in wonderful communities. And I'm going to tuck you both behind the curtain here. And then um, I'm, I got one more last housekeeping thing, and then we'll bring on Morris and Candace. And the, that, that is just to remind everybody, go to proaging.com. This afternoon, we'll have the recording of this session. In addition, we, I, I counted it up uh, at the beginning of this week. We've done 113 of these discussions since COVID hit. So there's just, there's tons of content in these, uh, in these discussions that we're having. Um, we've got a career center, we got our provider search. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see the current issues of uh, Positive Aging Sourcebook. You can order copies or you can look at the digital edition. Um, oh, before we get to Candace and Morris, uh, I can't believe another month is down. We have three more programs this month. N on uh, next week, Maryland Relay has put together an amazing program where we're going to get to see a variety of technology and how it can be utilized for people that are hard of hearing or just want more accessible uh, communi communication tool. Um, we're going to spotlight the Goodwin House Stronger Memory Program. And I'm here to give you a preview of something that we literally just booked yesterday. Something that we're going to try is, is that you're going to get to meet unscripted um, some residents that live in Maplewood Park Place, a life plan community. 
And this is something that we're hoping to do on a regular basis, sort of an unscripted conversation with the residents who live in these senior living communities. So if you've got a loved one or a client that's considering a life plan community, this is not a commercial for Maplewood Park Place. This is an opportunity to see and talk to and interact with residents in these various communities. And I'm hoping that this format works because we're just going to go up and down the East Coast and try to meet as many residents as we can if, uh, if, if we can pull this off. So we're just trying new things and, uh, you know, experimenting and some of them work and some of them don't but I'm, I'm really excited that you all are along for the ride with us. So with that, let's, uh, let's get this ride going. And I would love to bring on um, uh, um, Candace and Morris here. I will prompt the two of you onto the screen. And um, there we are. Um, thank you both for, uh, for making time for us today. Uh, I, I, I look forward to these discussions, whether it's with elder law attorneys, aging life care managers, daily money managers. These have just been so eye-opening to me, and I know they've been really eye-opening to our audience as well. But, um, but before we dive into the legal talk, let's, uh, let's get to know our panel members. Uh, Candace, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what led you to become an elder law attorney? and the firm that you're a part of. Yeah, hi, thank you so much, Steve. It's great to be here. I am the managing partner of the elder law firm, Frank Frank and Cher. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I started out in law uh, doing some corporate and real estate work and soon realized it just didn't fit my personality. And coincidentally, I was asked at my first law firm to handle a guardianship and an adoption matter. And once I got into that, I realized this is what I want to do. This is where I can really be myself and uh, considering, like I always thought of myself as sensitive and compassionate and not really the kind of lawyer that wanted to be um, antagonistic or fight with other attorneys. And I then took a course in elder law with my recently retired partner, Jason Frank, and we went out to lunch. He was, uh, at that time, it was law office of Jason Frank, a small firm. And um, we started talking. We realized we had a, you know, a good rapport. He offered me a position. And um, many, many years later, I'm, I'm still there running the firm. It was, we became Frank Frank and Share. And um, I have a fantastic staff now of other associates and paralegals and assistants. And um, mainly what I have done over the years is the Medicaid plans, helping people qualify for benefits if they're in uh, long-term care. And I've, it's a very, you know, it's a complex, challenging area of law. Um, we also have a, an estate department, um, which handles probate. Um, we also prepare wills and trusts and powers of attorney, and we deal with persons with special needs, helping them do their planning. So that's Man. that's really what oh, goes is, on with me. This is great. And, and <laughs> folks, uh, Candace dropped a lot of buzzwords that I know that uh, that everybody is interested in and has questions about. So uh, just a reminder, you, if you've got questions, you can type them in or when we're ready, you can you can raise your virtual hand and, and, and we'll be able to have a conversation around this. Yeah, we, the, the last three that we've done, Candace, Medicaid seems to be a, a really hot and confusing subject mm -hmm. matter. Um, the, you know, the other thing that I would like to note before I, I chat with Morris here is that, yeah, I've been doing this for 32 years. So I obviously know Jason Frank and it's wonderful to see that he's been able to retire and pass his firm on to such competent hands. But the interesting thing on last on this month's elder law, I mean, uh, aging life care discussion is many of the founding members of the aging life care community are now retiring and passing it on or selling their practices. So it's it's interesting to see this this second generation of um, 
of leaders emerging from elder law and aging life care and other professions. So, uh, so uh, Morris, uh, I'm I'm curious about your story. I, I I've known you for years as well, but I don't know if I've heard your story of what led you to become an elder law attorney and a little bit about your practice. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> like Candace and many of my other elder law colleagues, I didn't start out in elder law. It sort of just uh, fell into me or I fell into it. Um, I started out as a lawyer for the government. I worked for a number of agencies, including the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department, and then worked for a small firm that did mainly um, work for associations and uh, did estate planning. And during the course of my work at that firm, uh, my mother began to develop dementia. And I'm an only child, so I was her caregiver. And ran, she, she was living out of state for a while. So I'd be making lots of trips to Pittsburgh where she was and where I was born. And I got interested in this area of law, mainly through her experiences of going through dementia and ultimately having to live in a nursing home and all the various problems that are associated with that. So that's how I became an elder lawyer. I have been in practice for in elder law alone for almost um, um, 30 years now. And um, I also work in the areas of Medicaid, um, special needs trusts. I'm a certified, certified elder law attorney. I'm also a member of the Special Needs Alliance, which are both relatively exclusive organizations. I also engage in estate planning and the administration of estates after somebody dies, as well as guardianships, although I try to talk people out of a guardianship if there's some alternative Usually there's the alternative is a better approach than guardianship um, related to the Medicaid work and the estate um, planning uh, is the preparation of documents that most people should have like powers of attorney for financial decisions, uh, health care advance directives, as well as um, um, a last will and testament. Great. So that, that, is, that is my story. And I, I've been on my own. I'm in Bethesda, Maryland, and my uh, geographic uh, practice is um, Washington, D.C. and the uh, suburbs of Washington, D.C. in Maryland. Excellent. And then, Candace, your, your, I think your office is based up in Baltimore, but um, what's your primary geographic area that you serve? Yeah, well, it's interesting since um, the pandemic um, where we've all had to be working from home, we realized that we didn't need to be like county specific. We used to be based in Baltimore County. Now we're in Baltimore City, our actual office. But I've been able to help clients all over the state of Maryland because we don't have, we don't, I've learned we don't have to have these face to face meetings anymore. We can do everything by Zoom and email and faxing. Um, so I have broadened my reach with clients. They could be three hours away and I can still help them as if they were right here. Well, um, that's great. Now, I, 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 I told you a little bit about we've got, a, uh, we've got somebody in the audience today who called me this morning with a very interesting legal question that she wanted some feedback on. Um, and uh, her name is Mary. And Mary, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you could um, uh, give a little synopsis of the uh, of your um, your question for our panel members. Uh, Mary, can you hear me? Mary, you're unmuted. S say something, Mary. Okay. Well, if um, hopefully Mary will come on here. Uh, um, and, uh, Mary. Okay. But, um, all right, let's ho hopefully Mary, uh, we'd love to hear your, um, you, have you share your story, um, and get some feedback from Morris and Candace. 
So um, you're unmuted now and you can share that with us if you like. Um, but let's, uh, while we're waiting for Mary, let's dive into maybe if you, if you all, if you both would like to just sort of share some words of wisdom for folks that are out there in the audience in terms of some of the things that steps that we can take that can help prevent some of the challenges that I know that you've seen in both of your practices over the years. Um, I would love to, to sort of hear what, what's, what some of the words of wisdom that you offer folks. Well, let, let me say before I answer that question that one thing that both um, Candy and I did not mention is that Candy is the current, uh, or Candy is um, an officer of the um, Maryland State Bar Elder Law Section and one day will be the chair, maybe next year, maybe the year after that. And I am uh, a past chair of the Maryland State Bar Elder Law Section. So we've both been involved in uh, uh, the state bar in the area of elder law. Um, my words of wisdom is that you have to prepare ahead of time because by the time a problem develops, it may be too late. A lot of what I do and I think what Candy does is dealing for the situation where somebody becomes incapacitated is, and is unable to make their own decisions. And under the law, um, only you can make decisions for yourself. And if you haven't designated your wishes for someone else to act on your behalf, if you're no longer able to make those decisions, it's too late to really effectuate what ideally things you would like to have happen. So I'm reminded of some of you who are of my generation may remember on TV, there used to be a commercial for uh, Quaker State Oil where the guy would be holding a can of oil and he says, you pay me now for the can of oil or you pay me later and they're hauling up an engine because the, uh, uh, the, the, the car uh, fell apart because it didn't have enough oil in it. And it's sort of the same way that uh, there are relatively um, easy things and not terribly expensive things that one can do to prepare for the possibility of incapacity. But by the time they reach that point where uh, they haven't done anything, it's too late. Great. Um, let me just check in with Mary again. Mary, you wanna try saying something? Okay, all right. Yeah, her mic's not working. Um, Candace, any words of wisdom that you yeah. uh, could share? Yeah, I, I totally uh, agree with uh, with Morris that at the very least, every adult should have their documents in place. You don't realize how important that power of attorney can be. That's the document where you're appointing someone to manage your finances and your assets, because that document can really prevent the need for guardianship, which Morris and I both say we we like to avoid when, if at all possible. Um, the other, the other thing I, I would recommend is when you're facing, um, or you or a loved one mm -hmm. facing the need for, for a nursing home, that you don't want to just take advice from anyone or even go online and look at, look at, look, try to look up Medicaid regulations. You've got to meet with a qualified attorney because you will hear 10 different things about how to protect assets, how to qualify for these very important benefits. And unless you're working with an elder law attorney who does this day in and day out, you're gonna get bad advice that could really be costly in the long run. Okay. So that, that's a good tip I have. I think, I think we got Mary now. Mary, oh. can you say something? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear okay. me? Okay, okay, so thank you so much. I gave you the warm up. So the uh, Mary's got an interesting story that I think can hopefully you two can give her some words of wisdom. But I also think it could be really good in terms of talking points for this, uh, estate planning and, and what have you. So Mary, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I, I appreciate you both being here today. Uh, I I have a question about a case I was involved in. I was a beneficiary in a in a in a will, and whoever thinks that when they are a beneficiary that they'd have to go to court, hire a lawyer, uh, fight against attorneys who are supposed to be resolving the estate, it was uh, pretty much of a nightmare for almost four years. And finally, um, I was in the courtroom a couple of days ago in a different state, uh, and the um, 
the I guess I had a question for you um, when it comes to settlements and, and wills and that sort of thing, whether if somebody signs a settlement with an attorney and then thinks later that they shouldn't have done it, it's likely that that is not something they can retract because the judge has already approved it. Is that is that that's what my one one question I have that I signed an agreement with the attorneys about my bequest and um, I can't go back on that agreement, can I? Can well, you hear me? You want to speak to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, the rules differ from state to state. So uh, I don't know what this is the state of Pennsylvania. Well, I, I can't. Uh, you said Pennsylvania. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I can't speak to what the rules are in Pennsylvania. It, it, each each state is different. But uh, generally, once you um, the general principle is that if you agree to something, you uh, you have agreed to it. And there may be circumstances that can um, allow you to reverse what you did. But obviously, it's a lot harder to undo something once it's once it's done. If I wanted to do that, what would be the procedure for doing that? Would I reach out to the estate attorneys or to the judge? Do you know? Um, well, I, 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 I would I would consult with a Pennsylvania attorney as to the best course of action. Yeah. It sounds like it would be difficult, Mary, because if the estate included other beneficiaries. Yes. They've already you know, it's already been resolved. They've gotten their shares or their bequests. Um, Nobody's gotten them yet. They're just in the beginning you know, processes of doing that. Yeah, but. then you might want to move quickly if you're going to ask for some type of uh, retraction or, you know, a new, a new agreement, but it, it sounds difficult. And in the case of uh, settlements, when attorneys and judges and, and so forth go on, go into a courtroom, uh, I understand that often these discussions are off the record or are out of the courtroom. And that's what happened in this particular meeting several days ago. Uh, the judge went off the record. He wanted to talk and we agreed to talk about settlements. But I, I made the mistake of assuming that this uh, judge was going to be helpful to me. And I had wanted a certain amount of money for interest because this case had been going on for four years. And the judge actually ended up being working against me by saying simply, you're not allowed. You, you should, why should they give you what you want, even though you think you're entitled to it? So I just thought, I wondered if that was something that you all had ever experienced where a judge sort of gets sort of out of line, I think, and influences, tries to influence the settlement between the estate lawyers and a beneficiary uh, when um, he was simply being asked to to comment on it, but he, he sort of kind of put his thumb on the scale, I think, by suggesting that um, the settlement that I wanted was inappropriate, that I should not expect to get that. Did you well, have an attorney? You might need to get no, an attorney I didn't. to look at it. Yeah, you know, maybe it's yeah. time to have some, someone there in Pennsylvania, an estate attorney there, take a look at the situation and let you know if you have any rights to, to go forward. Mary, you may have learned the hard way that judges are not advocates for any particular side. Their job is not to try to push for the best of a particular person, but rather to uh, look at the case as a whole and come to a resolution that, that one, or, one or more parties may not agree to or like. Yes, I, I certainly understand that. I guess what I meant was um, that uh, I didn't expect him to, 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 to sort of say to me that I wasn't entitled to what I wanted. I would have thought he would have remained neutral and simply said, well, you know, see what you can do or more power to you kind of thing, but not really to say, why should they give you what you want? You, sh you shouldn't be getting what you want. You need to back off of that. It just seemed rather odd for a judge to be doing that, but I'm sure that these guys are all used to trying to throw everybody off their positions and reach a settlement. Many of them don't want to go through trials. And so this was an attempt to stave off a trial. Well, this is, uh, Mary, I really appreciate you sharing this interesting story. I feel like I'm listening to an episode of Law and Order, it's, uh, but with the elder <laughs> law estate planning twist, I, I'm, and I'm not making light of your situation. I know it's- Yes, I appreciate it. Could I just ask one other question independent of something else? 
um, in preparing my own uh, final documents, uh, you know, will and and, and so forth. Um, frequently, I've noticed that, that there are many, many attorneys who want to encourage trusts that are developed. And I wondered if you felt, either one of you felt that you um, are okay when people don't want to do trusts. Um, whether you, whether you encourage people to try to sort of bypass that. I understand there's a difference between privacy when you don't have a trust, that you have more privacy when you do have a trust. But um, if there aren't any children involved um, and there uh, is some money involved, would it be possible to avoid a trust? Yeah, or maybe in, in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tuck you behind the curtain there, Mary. And um, yeah, maybe if... Uh, if Candy and Morris, if you talk about, you know, what is the purpose of a trust and when it's appropriate, uh, that would be interesting to Mary and all of us. Well, <clears throat> well, a trust is um, basically a trust is a contract between the person who creates the trust called the grantor, the person who administers the trust is called the trustee, and the person who gets benefits from the trust, which is called the beneficiary. And a trust could be very similar to just owning property outright, whereas uh, it's owned by the trust and the advantage of the trust in that circumstance was that it, the assets wouldn't have to go through probate. They would be distributed in accordance with the terms of the trust. So the trust is a little more efficient as far as distributing assets after one passes away. Um, it, it, it costs some money to have a trust created and it costs some money to title assets into the trust. So um, uh, you pay some money up front, but you pay less as far as probating the assets uh, after uh, you die. Uh, that's one purpose of a trust. Another purpose of a trust is to uh, distribute assets uh, for the benefit of somebody who may not be able to handle money on their own or to protect the funds in case that the beneficiary needs public benefits. And both Candy and I uh, do uh, what we call special needs trusts. And um, uh, that's another purpose of the trust. If you're relatively wealthy, a third purpose of a trust, particularly if you're married, is to try to reduce or eliminate estate taxes. And um, the estate taxes uh, are of concern if in DC you have more than $4 million or in Maryland, if you have 5 million or uh, 10 million uh, combined for a couple. Uh, there's also a federal estate tax, which right now is over $11 million per person that may get reduced to the 5 million number um, in a couple years. And if Congress um, changes the tax code, who knows what it will be. But the, the, those are some of the purposes of, of, of trusts. You certainly don't need to have a trust. Your assets can pass through will. An, another alternative is to have what we call transfer on death or payable on death, where you name beneficiaries to various assets. If you have a retirement account, such as an IRA 401k, generally they don't pass through the will. They would pass through beneficiary designations as would life insurance. Okay. Yeah. Candace, anything? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I, I am not a, a fan of trusts at all. I find that a will can accomplish most everything a trust can. M Morris mentioned the situations where a trust might be um, advisable. It's very few. You, if you have property out of state, if you have a, a disabled child, or you need somebody to manage um, an inheritance for, for someone or, or assets for someone um, or tax purposes, but a, a trust is expensive. A simple will often can, can, can accomplish what needs to be done with some, some looking at beneficiary designations as well. Um, our probate process in Maryland is not that expensive or difficult. Um, to go through. So in, in most cases, I don't recommend trusts at all. Great. Well, Mary, I hope that was helpful. Um, got questions are flowing in, folks. So this is, I, I always love this. The uh, Heidi Garvis, who's an aging life care manager, says, how strong is the demand for professional health care agents with medical power of attorney? For instance, with solo agers or somebody who may not have a spouse, as aging life care managers, we provide this service. Uh, curious, 
at how, well, number one, you know, Heidi's question, but also maybe how do the two of your practices work with aging life care managers? Uh, well, typically my clients would have a family member to act as their healthcare agent. Um, very unusual circumstances where they have uh, no one to step in, but it's good for me to know that there are professionals that will step into that role. And I, I'm hoping you can send me some, or I can gather some information. So I have that to give to clients who might need it. Um, so that's, that'd be helpful to me. I have not worked with mm -hmm. many professional healthcare decision makers. Um, as just stated, more often than not, a family member makes a healthcare decision. There are, the, the, the circumstance where somebody is sort of what I call sort of the last person standing of the generation, the spouse is gone, there may not be children. Um, those are very difficult cases to find somebody to make decisions. Um, I have worked with professionals on occasion with uh, regarding making financial decisions, but it, it's rare uh, on, the, on the healthcare side. Great. Um, and uh, yeah, it's good to know. I mean, the, the changing demographics of, you know, um, uh, older adults being single older adults and what have you sort of uh, leads me to think that there may be a uh, more of a, a demand out there down the road uh, for what Heidi is referencing to. Um, okay, let's see. Pam Feldman says, my dad does not qualify for Medicaid because of his pension. However, with his expenses and him supporting a sibling, he will not have enough funds to support himself. Is there a way for him to qualify for Medicaid? He is currently living independently because he has no funds for himself, no long-term care insurance, or my mom who has Alzheimer's. Oh boy, that's a, a heart-wrenching story there. Um, any words of wisdom to, uh, to Pam. Well, in, in Maryland, um, a pension, uh, pension is income. So incomes looked at differently than assets. And as far as income to qualify for Medicaid, the, it's just basically that the income has to be less than the cost of the nursing home. Um, this is probably a situation where um, unless this pension is 10,000 a month, that, that um, pension is not gonna create a problem. Um, it is likely that if the spouse, the wife needed a nursing home, if their assets are so low that, that it could be immediate qualification for Medicaid. So they should uh, definitely talk, talk to an elder law attorney to take a look at their the income and assets and all the other particulars of their situation to give them advice and I think they would might be very relieved to see that if long-term care is needed, um, the Medicaid program would be a good good fit for them. The, right. the rules are a little different if you want to have Medicaid help out in a venue other than a nursing home. So if you want to have Medicaid help out in assisted living or at home, income becomes more of a complication. Uh, in in Maryland. Uh, if your income is above a certain amount, it is very, very difficult to get care outside of a nursing home. And also in Maryland, uh, even if your income was low enough, there are insufficient uh, slots available to get Medicaid to help out um, if you wanted care at home in Maryland. In the District of Columbia, however, there is a program where you can get home care through Medicaid, uh, there is an income cap. And if you are over the income cap, it is hard but not impossible to still qualify um, to get home care. Uh, also on the subject of pensions, uh, that is one area where um, there's a big difference between how Medicaid eligibility is considered in Maryland and in the District of Columbia. And I should just point out that Maryland is a state uh, federal program and each state has sort of their own rules uh, for eligibility. Uh, now I'm talking not about income now, but, but, but a, a, a pension as an asset like an IRA or 401k. 
in Maryland, those assets are considered available to um, pay for cost of care and need to be spent down before you qualify for Medicaid. However, in the District of Columbia, uh, retirement assets such as IRAs, 401ks and the like are not counted. They're off the chart as far as uh, determining financial eligibility. Wow. Um, you know, the one thing in, in her statement, in Pam's statement that sort of makes me think that consulting with one of you of your colleagues would be a great idea is, is that he has this pension and he's supporting his sibling. And I think that perhaps um, an attorney or an advisor could guide him on the best way to use his assets to assist a sibling. And there might be some ways to get that sibling on assistance so that he's not utilizing his, um, his cash to do that, which could compromise he and his wife's care. Um, that's just me Monday morning quarterbacking there. Um, let's see, um, Ken Silverstein says, I am named in a trust and only a beneficiary if my cousin dies. This trust has been in effect for over 30 years and I've never received any kind of accounting. Even though my co cousin is still alive, am I entitled to any kind of accounting? Boy, that's that's interesting. That might be spell, spelled out in the document. Sometimes a trust could say, no, you know, who's entitled to an accounting or if accountings are required at all. So I, I think it would ha you'd have to see if it's what language is in the document. There's, there's also a law that both uh, have been enacted in the District of Columbia and Maryland, which is called the Uniform Trust Act. And that speaks to who has the rights to accounting if the document itself doesn't address it. Okay, um, that's interesting. I never, uh, good question, Ken. Um, let's see, John Jerome says, please keep in mind that a reverse mortgage can be a viable way to help people age in place, pay for medical expenses, all right. Yeah, and I'm assuming, John, you, you can help folks with reverse mortgages. So, yeah, and actually, well, that this is great because, you know, we're talking about aging life care. Uh, how do you work with um, various financial vehicles like reverse mortgages, long-term care insurance? Is that something that when you're consulting with your clients that comes into the discussion? Um, and do you how do you work with those professionals or do you provide guidance in these areas? Well, certainly long-term care insurance is a, is a big factor in determining uh, whether you need Medicaid or not. Uh, policies that were issued in the 80s and 90s or even the, the aughts offered exceptional benefits. I, I saw, talked to a client the other day who has lifetime care and gets paid the equivalent of about $10,000 a month from their long-term care insurance policy. So people fortunate enough to be in that situation, they probably can just private pay and uh, be okay without having to uh, uh, rearrange assets and the like to qualify uh, for Medicaid. Uh, those policies aren't available today. The long-term care insurers realize that they, they were being too generous in what they were offering. And, and, and that's in part why there are fewer long-term care insurance um, options available today than there were uh, many years ago. Uh, so that's a, that's a big factor. Uh, certainly uh, for reverse mortgage, you could use the equity in your home to help pay for care. The one quirk about long-term care insurance and why it's not always useful for the people who come to me is that you have to be living in the home for the long-term care insurance, I'm sorry, for the reverse mortgage to work. If you, if you move to a nursing home, the, the reverse mortgage uh, is unwound and um, you really can't take advantage of it too much if you're in a nursing home. Yeah, how about you, Candace? Have you had any sort of various vehicles like reverse mortgages, long-term care insurance sort of play into your practice? Sure, it's always a question that I ask, you know, when I'm getting information about a client, do they have, a, you know, do they have any mortgages, including a reverse mortgage? Do they have long-term care insurance? Because it certainly plays into the advice that I'm um, going 
to give them. But I, I don't, you, you know, I don't push reverse mortgages at all. Um, but it, you know, uh, possibly might discuss long-term care insurance and the benefits, but then refer out to professionals who, you know, who can help them and give them more guidance on, on the products. Great, great. One other point about long-term care insurance is that it's something else that you need to obtain long before you need it. If, mm -hmm. if you think you're gonna need nursing home care, it's probably too late to get long-term care insurance. The traditional policies have medical underwriting or what we now term uh, pre-existing conditions. And if they get any whiff that someone may need long-term care, uh, you're not gonna be eligible. There are like hybrids now available, like you can combine it with life insurance and the like, which may be available to people who may have some long-term care need already or are older, but um, one needs to study those carefully to see if it makes sense in their situation. Great, okay, we got a few more, we got some more questions coming in here. And I actually, I, I got an email, a question that I, uh, before the event, and um, this, this, this person says, I have an old friend who lives near me and needs someone to serve as an agent under financial power of attorney, but she's not interested in having an attorney be the person that serves that capacity. Do you know of anyone or any entities who might serve in this role? And I'm, I'm curious if you've come across anything like, like this and perhaps like Heidi, the aging life care manager might be a, a professional uh, that would serve that. But am I, am I incorrect in, it's good to have an attorney draft up the document that would be the financial power of attorney, but you don't necessarily need to have an attorney serving in that capacity. It, it, am I correct in that? Right. That, that's, that's correct. Actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that that's correct. No, the, the agent, um, again, is typically a, a friend or family. Under certain circumstances, um, attorneys in my firm will agree to act as power of attorney. But there, there, there's in, a distinction mm -hmm. between attorney at law, which is a lawyer, and attorney in fact, which is someone acting as an agent under a power of attorney. One other thing to keep in mind, though, is that Powers of attorney are very, very useful documents, but in the wrong hands, they are a license to steal. They could be used to uh, financially abuse whoever signed the power of attorney. Uh, there are cases where people's houses were taken in all sorts of nasty situations. So it is very, very, very important to have somebody that you trust and have confidence in to serve as the agent under a power of attorney. Um, if one needed a guardianship where the guardian um, would be, or guardian of the property in Maryland or conservator in DC would be serving in a similar role, they need to be bonded and they have to file reports with the court. There is less restriction on that for just a, a private uh, power of attorney. So uh, one needs to be very careful about who is the decision maker. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, well, hopefully that, uh, thank you for your feedback on that question. The, um, uh, okay, so I've got a long one here, but it looks pretty good. It's is that the question is about special needs trusts and accelerated death benefits that are part of a life insurance policy in which the language on the rider to the insurance policy is confusing. And it says the benefit when used may affect your Medicaid benefits. If and when you use your accelerated death benefit, which becomes a living benefit, how should one plan to use this money and the benefit? Is it necessary to put these benefits into a special needs trust to protect these funds from being counted so Medicare eligibility is not negatively affected? Um, so uh, <laughs> I know that was confusing. Hopefully you understood what I, uh, what I read there. Um, what are your thoughts on something like this? <laughs> Go on, Morris. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, it's it, it's it's hard to know exactly what's going on without seeing the the actual document and what, and and that's generally a rule that um, 
you have to see what the underlying document is to figure things out. And, and sometimes when you take a clause or something um, and ignore the rest of the document, uh, you may not be able to interpret it properly. But I mean, the general rule is that if for Medicaid is that if you have access to funds during your lifetime, it could be a countable asset. So if this acceleration clause means that funds could be available for the person to use during their lifetime, then Medicaid would treat that as an asset that has to be used and spent down. Um, I mean, one of the things about Medicaid is that it's not whether you actually do something or not, but whether you have the theoretical right to do it. So even if there's a, if, if there's a trust say, and the trust says uh, you, you could take some money out, the fact that you never took the money out is irrelevant for Medicaid. It's the fact you had the ability to access the funds that they would uh, consider as an, as an asset subject to spend down. But um, if, the person if, if, the, if the person has a disability, then a special needs trust might be available to um, uh, protect the asset, but it's just hard to say from the way the question was presented. Great, great. Well, um, man, we got through a lot today. Um, uh, and I, I feel like we were responding so much to the questions from the audience. I, I kind of cut you guys short on sharing words of wisdom. I'm, I'm curious, like in, in your practice, what, what are you, what are y'all seeing now? Like, what is, what are some of the, the, the challenges that clients are coming to you with that those of us in the audience can be aware of so that we don't, uh, that we potentially avoid future mistakes, but also that we're consulting with professionals like you to, um, you know, minimize taxes, minimize the trauma that could, could occur in our families when we're gone or when we're incapacitated. Any, any thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, getting estate planning done is, which is just a matter of getting the four important doc, three important documents, a will, a power of attorney, and a medical directive. Um, if you had those documents, you're ahead of the game because you're not leaving a mess for your loved ones. If something happens to you, they can step in and take care of everything. Um, and you are avoiding the need for anybody to go to court to become your guardian, which is an expensive and burdensome um, way to, to get help for people who are disabled. Um, so that that's critical. Um, you know, it's hard to say on the Medicaid side because we really considered that crisis planning in many situations, you don't know when you're going to get sick or if you're ever going to need a nursing home. Um, and I find it very unusual that um, somebody is willing if they're if they haven't been diagnosed with anything that could cause them to need a nursing home for anyone to consider giving their money away to start what's called the five year look back for Medicaid, which means when you apply when you're applying for benefits, they're asking to see everything you've done with your finances for the past five years. They want to see all your statements. And there's a question on the Medicaid application, what have you given away? So if you've given something away and you don't need a nursing home for more than five years, you don't have to tell Medicaid about that gift. But um, my point is that um, even if you haven't given anything away, which again, I say is rare because people really don't wanna give their money away if they're well to their, to their family or put it in a trust and tie it up, that even within that five years or even right when that crisis hits, you can still do planning because in Maryland, we have very good uh, Medicaid gifting rules and protections for the spouse who's still at home. So it really is never too late to consider that you can protect things. So that's, I think, a good, uh, good thing to know. I, I agree with everything um, that 
Candy just said. Uh, on a slightly different uh, topic, uh, I, I don't mean to this to sound self-serving, but it's really not a good idea to try to create documents on your own, either online or copying them from somebody else. Mm -hmm. There are, everybody has unique circumstances and there are things that may need to be in a document that would not be in a particular boilerplate and um, uh, you're really doing yourself a disservice in the long run by not having somebody competent to help you initially uh, an example uh, in the district of columbia there's a there's a law that says you have to have certain words in the document if you want the document, the power of attorney document to apply to real estate you own. And no matter how good the document is, if you don't have those magic words, you're, you're, you're out on your ears. And so if you just sort of download a generic document, it, it's more likely than not, not to have those special words in it and it wouldn't be useful at all uh, in the context of real estate. Um, let's see, Eldorna has a question. If you don't have a trust, can creditors sue and take your assets? Um, I, I sort of think uh, that's going to be another answer. It depends or I need more information. But um, can you comment on that, that question? Well, a trust doesn't necessarily guarantee protection against creditors. It depends what kind of trust it is, who created it, who, 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 who's the beneficiary, whose money is put into the trust. So um, uh, you're right, Steve, it's, it's one of these, it, it depends things. After somebody dies, there is usually a small period of time in which creditors can file a claim against the estate and they have to follow certain procedures to have that claim perfected. And if they miss that deadline, they're out of luck. There's a similar process for trusts that if you follow certain procedures, you could also limit the time in which a uh, trust would be exposed to creditors after the grantor of the trust dies. Great. And we're, we're wrapping up. We got about uh, five minutes to go. W one thing that I would love to get your, both of your feedback on is, is that I'm sure you've seen some very challenging family situations um, that the you know, when we talk about money, some of the questions that have come out today are, uh, you know, kids and uh, beneficiaries not knowing anything about mom and dad's money or their loved one's money or the finances or legal documents and things of that nature. And um, is this is this a common issue that you see when people come to you? Is is that a lack of communication? amongst uh, family members and, and parents on what they want to have done and, and how they want it to have done. And, you know, do you run into problems where people, they draw, they draw up these documents, but they don't share with their families where those documents are so that they can um, execute them? Right. In fact, I had a family um, where they had previously drawn up documents, but put them in um, a locked safe and didn't tell the family that they had them, didn't have copies anywhere. And uh, we had to we had to actually get um, a court order to open the safe to get the documents that would have prevented all that from happening. So there are, there's a lot of, um, you know, parents these days who are um, very secretive about their assets and don't tell their children anything. And I did, I've had many children come in and say, what do I do? I have my parents sick now and can't really tell me where things are, how, and I don't know if I'm power of attorney, what, what can I do? So there are, um, there's often we're using something called a um, specific transaction it's not a full guardianship, but there's, it's a way to get a court order to do certain things and look for certain assets or find out if there's life insurance with a certain company. Um, so we, we rely on those a lot. Again, trying to avoid having to get guardianship and 
That's what we yeah. want everyone to know. That's why you do your planning. So you don't leave this mess for your family. So yeah, yeah. Do the planning and communicate with your planning. Yeah. And, and I know that many of us grew up in households where, you know, you don't talk about money, but when we're talking about adults talking about money, I think it's a little bit different. It's a, seems to be a common theme on these elder law discussions. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring it up. Yeah. Here. Discussions are important. I've seen it all over the map. Uh, they're very close families where there are no secrets and everyone gets along. And then you have uh, um, less um, friendly uh, relationships. Typically, if there's a blended family where there's a second marriage, that could present um, adverse dynamics. Also, um, I've seen many cases where the parents, they, they love their children, but they're wary of the in-law. And they'll say, well, how do I prevent my son-in-law from getting at the money I, I want to bequeath to my daughter after I die? How do, how do I keep the daughter-in-law's hands out of it? I, I, I've seen that quite a bit. Wow. Well, man, I can't believe it. this. These hours go by so quickly. Uh, and every one of these discussions is different. Um, so it really speaks to the questions, it speaks to the different uh, practices. Um, this has been this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you giving of your time. And uh, we recorded this, but then I'll also share this recording with everybody in the audience, along with contact information for Morris and Candace. And um, I, I really want to thank you both for for being our our guests here today and and the feedback that you've provided. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. It was our, our pleasure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, everybody enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.